I will try and speak slowly. Um, it's been very useful for me to have lunch with a very nice Greek lady in Italian. Man, so I've been trying to speak slowly for about the last 15 20 minutes to practice. That's right. So it's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I know we, we say that when we stand in front of an audience, but it's a, it's a great pleasure for me at my first Piazza conference to be able to, to speak about this topic. I know that's a very long title, there is a reason for this. So the campaign, I'm sure you all know, is linked to a botanical garden and also a science museum organisation. And my immediate background before I joined the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland was in the botanic garden world. So I will tell you a little bit about this and how synchronicity means, and, and a little bit of me asking and knocking on the door means that I'm here today to speak to you about the new campaign. So my talk will cover a little bit about me so that you all know where I have come from to be here. Some information about botanic gardens. The new partnership between IASA, BGCI and Excite the forthcoming IASA campaign, and then my hopes beyond the campaign. So this is where I came from. This is the moment to go, oh, thank you. So now as a speaker, I feel a lot more relaxed. So I speak slower now. So this was me at 16. It's not, don't worry, there's only one picture about me. <laughs> but I want you to understand that I came from a, a, a horticultural background. So initially, very much... <laughs> No plans. That was a reaction. <laughs> Initially horticulture, but then into education. And I spent then many years with... No? No education. <laughs> no education, no botanic garden. <laughs> Just zoos. <laughs> and behaviour change and zoos. You can hear me, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then into, <coughs> into horticultural colleges, land-based colleges and universities, where I also started to learn about equine and small animal care and all of this, but very much about education. And then, about 11 years ago, I landed in the botanical <coughs> garden world. Now, the botanical garden world is quite different to horticulture. In the UK, definitely, if you study horticulture or you, you work in a garden, not botanical, or a nursery, or a garden centre, you probably know very little about a botanical garden. They are, they are an amazing <coughs> section of uh, botany of plants, but, but very much a niche. And I landed in this amazing world of the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. That's one of the world's uh, best botanical gardens in, in many criteria, including scientific research with many scientists working in 75 countries currently doing <coughs> botanical research. And here, doing education. But it's not all botany, so I'm trying to show now I've got some understanding of plants. I also have a, a passion, you, you may say a hobby, for the marine world. But this expanded into some volunteering, with beach cleans or with citizen science, but I'm now proud to be the, the Scottish-based trustee for the Marine Conservation Society, which gives me um, some direct contact with trying to do good things for the ocean. And then I've landed in the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland, and we have a zoo, and we have a wildlife park, and we have international projects, and we work in biodiversity conservation. So hopefully you can see that I have some plants, I have a, a passion for marine, and I have a big passion for now the wildlife world and the zoo world all together. Why I moved from the wonderful place of the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh and the wonderful Botanic Garden Network, which it is, why did I move? Well, the first reason is because biodiversity is not just plants and it's not just animals, and it's not just marine, and it's not just things on the land. It's everything. And, and as I've got older, 
there's a bit of a game going on down here as to how old I actually am. So, uh, but as I've got older, I've become more passionate about conservation. Gen you know, it's a big thing now. And so genuinely, if you're going to do that, strategically I feel I needed to understand more about the animal world, as well as <laughs> learning more about education. Um, another reason I moved is that in my trips to zoos, and I've visited zoos for many years as a visitor, I now go with different eyes, but for many years as a visitor, I would go and people get, you know, people are there from all backgrounds. Someone has said this this morning already. People come from all backgrounds, all walks of life, visit zoos. Very powerful, very emotional. And the last reason, and probably the most important, that I've never ever, ever in 10 years visiting maybe 50 botanic gardens all over the world have I seen a face as excited as that <laughs> looking at a plant. <laughs> Sometimes close, but never that excited. So if you add in the fact that, that all those people come, I, I'm teaching you what you know, but I'm showing you where I am, yeah? So all those people come, you can really get emotion. I think, what is the potential for this? And then, another thing that excites me about your world, and we've heard about the new strategy from Wazda, but in the Botanic Garden world, I wrote a strategy once. I wrote a strategy for learning, and said, oh, we need to change behaviour of our visitors. And people went, oh no, you can't say that. That's, that sounds like we're going to brainwash. And I never intended to put it over a gate. Come here today and we will change your behaviour. But I did have a passion. And so again, for me, it's wonderful now to be in a community of people where this is the normal language. You are all talking, many presentations I've heard all this week about the, we don't quite know how to do it yet, fully, but the passion is there to, to change behaviour for conservation, which I think is another wonderful aspect about the world I now am in. But, I promise you, how many people here have worked in a botanical garden? Worked? Work, you One? Yes? No. You sure? <laughs> okay. So we have just one. Anyone else worked? Two. Ah, but I, yes, we've already spoken, yeah? So we're on the same planet already. I think maybe we're on the same planet, but it's a parallel universe, I promise you. If I, I feel, um, I don't know how this translates, I feel quite inept that after being uh, a leader of education and learning in one of the world's best botanic gardens for 10 years, I have not engaged more with the zoo world in my job. I have failed. I tried, but not hard enough. Now I'm in the zoo world, I'm even more excited about the potential to do this. So this is why I have the passion to try and <laughs> synchronous. So both are living collection visitor attractions. <coughs> Definitely conservation organisations. The governance, the networks and the conferences are so similar you would not believe. I, I promise, you could put any of you straight into a botanic garden education conference, you'd be at home. You'd be all talking about biodiversity con conservation, education, maybe not behavior change so much, but <laughs> everything else. Um, education, programs, the research activities, the goals of this for conservation, very, very similar. And the staff, which I think is the most important, the ones I've met in a few zoos, and, and certainly many now in, in Edinburgh, they care, they have similar values, they care about the environment, sustainability, and biodiversity <coughs> conservation. We don't talk here this week about wildlife conservation. We don't talk about animal conservation. We talk about biodiversity <coughs> conservation. So I tell you a little bit now about the world I was in. It's a very nice world, it's wonderful. This is, this is another benefit to you about engaging. When you get the, this is the cell now, you have the action later. So, um, they collect plants. And interesting difference with botanic gardens, of course, is that they can more easily, much more easily, go and collect wild living material. It's still the culture. There still needs to be permissions, 
but to go and collect wild plants, mainly seed, but certainly in some places living plants, no problem. You get the permits, you bring them back. So the gene pool is easily sustained. Um, cultivating plants, classifying plants, certainly in Edinburgh, um, much work is done in classifying plants because there's still lots to do. So traditional alpha taxonomy, looking at the, the physical characters, but more and more now they're doing genetic work, um, electron microscopy work, and, and classifying plants. And working with taxonomists is lovely, but I'm much more organised now in my life than I used to be. Um, and conservation, conservation projects all over the world. I, I give you one example, International Conifer Conservation Programme, which is based at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. So, this is this. But this is an education conference, I should tell you a little bit more about the education. So in Botanic Gardens, and, and Edinburgh is an example. So these are Edinburgh pictures, but, but many gardens around the world do the same. Schools education, very, very similar to the work that I've seen already in the zoo world. Adult education, maybe more so in some, um, but adult education at different levels from, from one day courses, through certificates, through to diplomas, all are there. Tertiary, I was very lucky at, in Edinburgh Botanic Garden that uh, we had a full-time master's program based at the Botanical Garden and also a full-time undergraduate degree program based at the Botanic Garden. So we had many students who were just there. And for a student to be just there, imagine if you had students that were at the, the, the zoo around this. I know there were some that have partnerships, so maybe it's similar. And then lots of capacity building. Um, this is just one image of, of people from 12 different countries doing a train-the-trainer course where you come up with the knowledge and you pass that on. So I know that these things happen in the zoo world. Synchronicity is something I believe in. So in September, I moved to the Royal Zoological Society of Scotland. And the very same week, um, I discovered that science centres don't read all this. But the key part, is, this was a, a web page, not my typing, but the key part is that science centres, museums, Joined forces with zoos, aquaria, and botanical gardens. I'm thinking, fantastic. This is perfect. I've just gone for these reasons, and suddenly there is an agreement being signed to collaborate for education. So, if you don't know, I'll, again, hands up if you've not heard of BGCI before. Hands up if you if you have not heard. Quite a few hands. So today I'm being useful. So this is Botanic Garden Conservation International. But I would, I would compare it probably with WASA, although I'm learning there are some differences, but it's the global organisation. Um, and next month, if you have the, the funding and the inclination, you could go to a conference similar to this in Missouri, which is the Botanic Garden Education Conference, which will be wonderful. Um, so BGCI, Excite, hands up again if you've not heard of Excite. Less hands. Um, European Network of Science Centres and Museums. So the three, and, and there is Mufanwi signing the Memorandum of Agreement. Wonderful. More synchronicity was that there is another <coughs> education collaboration in the UK called Botanic Garden Education Network. So this is for gardens, it's very UK. But there are also some zoos that are members. Not many, maybe three. But this year, the conference was at Paynton Zoo and Environmental Park. Synchronicity, which meant that myself, um, Stephen before, he left us for pastures new in Twycross. Um, <coughs> Elena and Polly went there and we actually ran sessions there, but, but engaged with the, with the Botanic Garden Conference about education at a zoo and environmental park with other zoos there. So, so that is a, is a good example of how that works. So, the campaign, which is what I'm standing here now to tell you about. The Let It Grow campaign comes from the Memorandum of Agreement, <coughs> and it's the first stage. So the agreement has no deadline, but the campaign is going to focus on local biodiversity. So, and, and the focus is there on local. Um, and we've, uh, we've already heard this morning from, I think, two speakers, the importance of, of keeping it to, to what we care. It's a two-year campaign starting January 2016, 
and it's to harness the power of citizen science to increase and enhance the value of local spaces for biodiversity. How will it work? Five aims. First aim is to raise awareness on local biodiversity. Just get more people aware of the biodiversity that is there and the importance of it. <coughs> Encourage people to let something grow. We have a term in the UK, rewilding. It's, it's quite bold and people often think it means putting wolves back. But it could be just letting a space grow more natural. The third aim is to measure local biodiversity. There is then a fundraising aim, but the fundraising will focus again on fundraising for local projects. Maybe it's that specific pulsatilla. So fundraising for local projects. And then the fifth point, which ties in with the memorandum of agreement, is to foster and build partnerships towards biodiversity, hopefully with science museums and botanical gardens. <coughs> so now I want to show you a few pictures of things that we've done at the Royal Zoological Society in, in Edinburgh, things that, we've, that we're doing, things that we've started, that we think are things that could be things that you may want to do within this campaign. The first one is, is BioBlitz. I'm going to ask for hands again, but there was a presentation yesterday from Portugal where there was examples of BioBlitz. So we have a workshop later, but a quick show of hands now to prepare me. Hands up if you've ever been part of an organisation that's carried out a BioBlitz. Hands up. And one more show of hands. Hands up if this is a completely new term for you. Perfect. Then we have a workshop later. All will become clear. In short, for now, it's measuring the biodiversity in a defined space. Typically, it's done in one day, but you, you bring people in, you work with scientists, and you identify what's there. More later. Um, the attraction of doing... It says BioBlitz, but let's just say connecting people with your local biodiversity. The advantage is it's enjoyable. It's very local, it's science linked, people get to meet scientists, they are identifying, they're documenting, and they're contributing with the information they collect to a, a bigger goal. And as you'll see, Bayaza, of course you know is the British and Irish, already they, they are branding bioblitzes within their own campaigns. So we hope that we can align. We've now in Edinburgh, um, and there is our wildlife garden leader, Amy. Put your hand up, Amy. We now have a wildlife garden. It doesn't look... Well, it looks wild, doesn't it? So we have an area in Edinburgh Zoo that we've denoted as a wildlife garden. Um, and we're looking to forward to how that will develop, and this will become the space where we do our biobits and research. And another Biasa program that, again, we and I are hoping to align with is one called Grab the Gap where it's about rewilding or, or enhancing biodiversity, maybe in a very small space. We also have a bus, and this bus is called Wild About Scotland, and it travels around schools, and it's teaching about biodiversity, but it's doing bug hunts. One of the, the key things that the, the, the guys on the bus do is they get off the bus, they get the children, and they go and look in the hedgerow next to the school. And they actually get the children looking at the biodiversity, that's around the school. Local partnerships is also a key to this. So to, to example what we're doing now, we have uh, great links with the National Museums of Scotland, um, with Deep Sea World, our, our bus was there recently, um, with the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh of course, and most recently this is a, a visitor, it's, it's an organic farm also has a restaurant, a cafe, and they do some education. And they are also going into environmental education, and, and, and our plan is that we will do some biodiversity activities with children in the farm. So, some examples of, of local partnerships that we have. Now, it's biodiversity conservation. So what is beyond this? So the campaign you hear more about in the workshop, but I would like you all just to think about the word biodiversity. I'm being a parrot, I, I'm repeating. But think, we've not talked in this conference about wildlife conservation or animal conservation. We've talked about biodiversity conservation, and that includes plants. 
And I think that is, that is something that's, that's maybe missing out of this room, but when you go to botanic garden conferences, I think the animals are missing in the room, if we're really going to achieve biodiversity conservation. So I have some thoughts beyond this campaign, because the memorandum has no, dime, has no deadline. So I think we need to think big for real conservation. I'm trying to. I'm trying to think big. I think we need major goals beyond just local biodiversity for two years. It's a great, but we need to go beyond that. I think we have potential beyond the campaign. I, I would like to see even more joint projects, joint interpretation, why not? Um, joint education program, communications, why not even conferences or a symposium or something where we get all those biodiversity <coughs> educators in the same space. I promise you, you would love it. They would love it. It would be great, you would learn lots. I see, I see many examples in zoos where there is communication about the plants. I've asked a few of you at this conference, I say, did you go to your local botanic <coughs> garden to get them to give you the, the really good images and information? No. But botanic gardens don't do that either. So the potential is there. And just imagine the potential. I think it's fantastic that EASA is the largest membership-based organisation for zoos and aquariums. But we've heard today the numbers. I know there are 3,500 botanical gardens. Um, how many thousand zoos in total? Thousands, yeah. Is it 5,000, 6,000 across the world, depending on how you categorise? How many science museums? Imagine a campaign in 12,000 organisations. I think that's the... And imagine then the impact you could have if you have a campaign in 12,000 organisations. I think it's doable. Um, a couple of examples, again, of how plants link to zoology. So this is our... Have you been to Edinburgh? Hands up if you've been to Edinburgh Zoo. Sorry, I should have asked that long ago. A good number of hands. Again, I invite the rest. This is our uh, chimpanzee exhibit called Bodongo. And, and the reason it's called Bodongo is because in Bodongo Forest in Uganda, we have a field station. And there are currently two projects in our field station operating in Bodongo. One is a, a Darwin initiative, and the other one is an Earthwatch project. One of the projects is looking at tree phenology, and the other <coughs> one is looking at local crops. They are both plant-related projects that ultimately have impact on the chimpanzees. Cool. Um, this was one tweet. I tweet, okay? No apologies for that. I'm a communicator. How can I not? So, this is a great Fauna and Flora International, and here they're talking of a, a, a post by Global Trees on why tree conservation relies on zoologists as well as botanists. Quite often you hear the other way around, but this was quite unusual that it was talking about how tree botanists need zoologists to help them. Um, much we can say about digital engagement, we, we've heard lots already, I think the potential is we are being scratched at. So there is much potential for this beyond now. Um, I also am learning more, I'm six months in now to my new world, and I'm learning about my Hausa and Iyasa and Waza, and I'm, I'm, I, I hope I'm learning quickly. But what I'm also learning is that many organisations are running biodiversity somethings. And so I'm hoping that in, in my little bit of input into the campaign now, we can try and pull all those things together. So we heard Tiago talking about you know, badging these resources and using them if appropriate. And we, I had an email last night from the, the CEO of BRZ encouraging again me to go and speak about the campaign this year as well. So the links are there, and, and this is definitely an ambition I have. The vast majority of botanic gardens do not do animals well. That was a bit of interpretation about the birds in Reykjavik Botanic Garden. Most have nothing. So you could really improve them. If you really care about zoology conservation, which I know you do, just think of the impact you could have on all those millions of people that visit botanic gardens that aren't getting to understand about the, even the natural wildlife that's in the botanic gardens often. So that's not covered. You guys could help them with that. Um, I could talk lots about the modern zoos and the fact that there's loads of plants in these places, and you know about these places. I've not been to three of those. But here is an example of what's commonly bracketed as a botanical garden that actually does animals really, really well. 
and it's in Australia. I don't know if anyone's been to this. Alice Springs Desert Park. It's a, it's a great place. They have a nocturnal house and, and there's lots of animals. But that is a, they come from a botanic garden ambition and have become a bi you know, they have both there. So it can be done. And that is about as close as I've seen to the face of the girl on the penguin. So this is a young guy that's grown a carrot and, and many botanic gardens and gardens now are growing vegetables and growing schools gardening and people are growing veg and they're eating them and they're getting that connection. Um, and, a, and a lady in America once at a conference talked about the fact that carrots, putting it in an animal zoo context, they're like the pandas in botanic gardens because they get people excited. So botanic gardens know, and I've spoke to botanic garden educators in the past and have encouraged them and they say, oh, but the problem is if we leave the zoos, everyone just looks at the animals and they don't come to us. We need to be better than that because it's biodiversity. Um, this was amazing. This was life-changing for me. I went to Montreal to a conference and I visited the biodome. And I walked in and it's the best I've seen. Maybe there are better. But it's the best I've seen in terms of it being a fusion of a botanic garden, a zoo and an aquarium. So it's not the best picture of the place, but you've got the cores free roaming, there were sloths and primates free roaming. There was lots of interpretation and engagement about the plants. You've got technology there and you've got a parent with a kid. And there's also an aquarium. The whole lot's in there. Um, and I could put many up, but if you, if you get the chance to go, it, it certainly was a, a, a moment for me. Social science we've talked a lot about. The reason I went there was for a, a conservation leaders project and, and the whole vision of the lady that ran this as a sociologist and anthropologist was to get people like you in the same room as social scientists and to get them talking. So not so many talks, more just talking. Um, and, and she was very visionary. I have one minute. I'm going to say, please link, think about linking with Botanic Gardens. Come and speak to me and I can show you even more benefits. But if nothing else, you can help them do what they do better for biodiversity conservation. My last picture is not the best picture, I would hope you agree. But the reason I put it up there is more of a vision. So. This is a primary school in Scotland, in quite a deprived area. I visited it one day because our bus was there, so I'd gone to see the bus. But while I was there, the teacher said, oh, we have a little wildlife garden. Would you like to see it? I said, definitely. Wildlife garden, yeah? Wildlife garden. So I went along, and this is it. I said, who helps you with this? She said, oh, no, I just do it. I, I Google, I get some bits, and we, we do that. Just think what 12,000 zoos, botanic gardens, and science museums could do if they, if they helped lots of schools all over the planet with things like that. And I don't think I'm being that innovative. Other people have done this, but we're not doing it. Um, it's nice to put quotes up. I feel a bit embarrassed. But I was gonna put, so I said that. I'm saying it right now. So that's me in 2015 saying if we really want to affect behavior change of our visitors and long-term impact for conservation on a grand scale, all living museums must, I think, believe, work in partnership together. Um, I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Thank you.